I'm going to talk about maps and pictures. I wasn't sure what to say. Um, it's going to be, I'm hoping to get to page two of the handout. I might not. I apologize in advance for page three. I apologize only because it's, it's sort of a stock uh, exemplar or something that I use. Um, I think I even used it at Jeanneco when I gave a talk about maps four years ago or something like that. But it's useful to have some maps in front of us, so I, I, I included it here. Um, some of you have been here, uh, perhaps too much, uh, to listen to me talking about things over the past five months. Um, uh, thank you uh, for doing that. But I listed some things here at the beginning of the handout that I'm not going to talk about too much. I think I'm going to talk about them as they come up in the rest of it. But those of you who have heard me talking about this stuff, all of this will be familiar, that I think to do an interesting pictorial semantics, we need to distinguish characters from contents and the way that contents come about as a picture is inserted into a context and so on. You know that I think pictorial content is descriptive and that there's a special thing called bare bones content, which is part of its character. Will come up, that stuff will come up soon. Um, the way I propose to go through things today, in order to, and I'll just take my <coughs> phone out so I can keep the time. Uh, the way I propose to go through things today is I'm going to first start, because this is an icon iconicity seminar, um, I'm going to try to, I'm just going to characterize a picture as a map. I'm going to say things about it. It's very leading because, you know, without a theory of maps, it's not clear why you would say these things about a picture. But I'm going to characterize pictures as maps first and try to say something interesting about what it is that makes pictures maps. And then I'm going to talk about what makes maps maps. That's what, make, what makes maps different from pictures, though, of course, they're going to be similar in lots of ways. And then if, if, if I've got time, you know, you know, actually I had to skip some things and so on. I, I might have to skip a couple of things toward the end. But I, I want to talk to you about some new ideas. In particular, I'm, I want to mention a couple of them because Achille brought them up and I think they're worth discussing. I have a different way of thinking about what it means to call something non-propositional that I think is somewhat useful, for example, but we, we're, not, we're not yet there. So, uh, so let's talk, let's first think about pictures. And just, and I, I don't care which kind of picture you've got, it could be a line drawing a, in your mind, a, a line drawing, a, a, a color photograph, right? Something like that, okay. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you a few things about pictures that I think are true. And the things that I tell you about pictures will show you how they're like maps, right? And that's, that's, the, um, that's the way we wanna go. So, um, <coughs> First, notice that these pictures that you've got in mind, they take up space, right? And they're colored. Or maybe they're black and white, but they've got colors at locations. That's what they do, okay? So colors occupy locations on a picture surface. Okay. And actually, every location on the picture surface has to have some color or other at it, okay? I'm just walking through the pictures as maps uh, part of the handout, the second section here. So every location on a picture surface must be colored. Okay, so you can't get a color that's nowhere. You need a location for a color, but you also need a color to go at every location, right? They need each other. Okay, um, and, and, and I, I actually wonder how you feel about this, and I had to bring up holes because we've got, you know, uh, I'm <laughs> flanked by Kasadi and Varzi. I, you know, um, I, if you don't have a color at a region on a picture, right, you've got a hole in your picture. It's not part of the picture, right? It's a hole. So you have to put colors somewhere, right? Um, or you just don't, or that, that thing is no, or, or that uncolored region is no more a part of the picture than the parts outside of the picture are parts of the picture. <laughs> They're not, right? Okay, so you need to put them there. Um, uh, I think that's cool. What's even more cool um, is that no two colors can occupy the same location on a picture. Remember, I'm not talking about mixing pigments, mixing paints to put them on a surface, right? I'm talking formally. If what you care about is that pictures have colors at locations, you can't have more than one at a location. You might have one color at a location that looks like a visible mixture of two other kinds of colors, but that's not what I mean. You can't put two colors at one location on a map, okay? And you could tell me this sounds awful uh, uh, as we go. I might, I might say I'll... So on a picture service, yeah, we, we, can't, uh, we can't do that. And in that sense, um, I'll just introduce a bit of uh, terminology. This is leading because it has to do with what I think maps are and how they work. But notice that if we're thinking about pictures, colors look syntactically. So remember, colors are parts of pictures. Pictures might represent colors too. That's nice. 
But colors are parts of pictures. They're actually, what I want to say, they're syntactic aspects of pictures. And syntactically speaking, if you've got to have a color, some color or other everywhere, you can't have more than one color at one location, right? Um, the colors um, form a syntactic incompatibility class. It's a class of features, it's just, and that's just a group of syntactic uh, features, such that every location needs one of them, but no location can have two, right? They're mutually incompatible. So the presence of red at a certain part of your picture surface excludes the presence of green. They can't both be there. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to connect this <clears throat> in a moment to what uh, Michael Roscorla and then Achille mentioning him called the absence intuition. Um, but before I do that, I just want to point out, now we've been talking about the way a picture surface is, right? It's got locations, it has colors at those locations. But um, locations in a picture represent portions of space, okay? Uh, perhaps from here or something like that, okay? Um, and colors placed on a picture surface, they have representational significance. There's a long story I'm happy to tell about exactly what I take the representational significance of a color at a location on a picture surface to be. I could tell that, but I don't necessarily want to just now because it might take us too long. <coughs> Suffice it to say, for now, when you put a color on a picture surface, you're saying something about the chromatic features of the scene there. Okay. Um, exactly what you're saying chromatically is, actually takes a little bit of unpacking and some work. But you are saying something about the chromatic features of a scene there. So it turns out that these two aspects of pictures, their locations and their colors, are both representationally relevant. They're relevant to what the picture says about the world. And the colors, these syntactic objects, obey a certain kind of uh, constraint. They're mutually incompatible, and every location needs to have at least uh, one of them. It turns out... Okay, and this, this is fun, and this, this matters. Um, uh, whatever those chromatic things are that these colors represent on a picture surface, right? Uh, these, what I call chromatically perspectival features. That should sound weird, but that's what they are, and it's, it is weird, but it's true. Um, but no two chromatically perspectival features can occupy the same part of space from here either. So what I said is, you know, the colors on the picture surface are mutually incompatible. And what's really nice is that the features that they represent about the scene, right, are also mutually incompatible. So one aspect, one portion of the scene represented <laughs> can't have more than one of these sort of chromatically perspectival features from here at the same time, right? So um, you get, Achille mentioned a kind of mirroring, right? And you might get a spatial mirroring of structure, but what I'm actually pointing out too is that these qualities that are mutually incompatible on the picture surface are actually representing a class of qualities that are themselves mutually incompatible in the scene represented. Right? So you can't have more than one of them in the scene represented at the same um, location. Um, and, these pic and, and like I said, these pictures have a spatial content, which I think is actually um, uh, two-dimensional. Uh, um, what this... so. Given this description of a picture, what I want to say is that this is a picture being a map. This is saying a picture is a map of something. A map of what? Well, it's a map of a 2D space, 2D, right? Pictures represent 3D scenes, usually, which is fine. But this is a map of a 2D space, a map of a space I can characterize from here in two dimensions. You might think of it this way. All I have to do to tell you where each point is is tell you what the angle is of my arm away from the center, right? And what the angle is of my arm around the clock, right? And I can tell you with two dimensions where every point is, right? <coughs> so there's that kind of space, which has weird, it's a weird space because it's 2D. It has weird chromatic features, but pictures actually are a map of that space. That's what pictures, are, that's what makes, pic, that's the way to characterize a picture as a map. And you just heard um, Achille talking about Bronner and talking about their view about maps, that there's this strange feature of maps. When a map says you've got a lake there, right, and it doesn't have blue over here, it indicates that there's no lake over there, right? There's this interesting absence intuition, and this is what Michael Rescorla called it, and, and that's fine, that characterizes maps. But I want you to focus on pictures because, look, 
Pictures have to put a color everywhere. Okay, some color has to go at each location and no location can have more than one. So if one part of a picture says there's this kind of reddish chromatic feature there, okay, and another place doesn't have that reddish sort of color on it, that other place doesn't so much say that there's no reddish chromatic feature there as it says that there's some other feature there incompatible with it, right? So when we're thinking about maps generally, right, um, it might seem confusing, it, it, it might seem strange uh, to say, oh, why is it that the map says there's no city here just because it failed to put a marker for a city here, right? I actually think in the pictorial case, it's a lot easier to see because the only features represented are this group of incompatible features and they're represented by a group of incompatible properties on the surface of the picture, right? So the presence of one quality there excludes the presence of any other quality. Right? And so the picture commits to things being ways across its whole space such that something like the absence intuition is vindicated. If the picture doesn't say it's red over here, it isn't. But the way a picture doesn't say it's red over here is not by saying nothing. It's by saying that it's green or blue or purple or something else over here, right? So pictures are... Pictures, at least, if we think of them as maps, are highly committal with regard to chromatic features of things, and they respect something like an absence intuition with respect to these. And I think that's exactly the way it works um, in maps generally. And in fact, what I think maps do, I think what maps are in effect, this is not an evolutionary point about maps or any of that stuff. What maps are in effect is a way of making pictures less expressive in one sense and radically more expressive in another sense. Um, so uh, take the picture that I told you is a map. It has this one incompatibility class of syntactic features, okay? And now imagine this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you as many more incompatibility classes as you like that you can layer on top of each other, okay? Yeah. Can I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I quickly ask you? So, this is very interesting. You said the, the way a picture says it's not red over here is not by saying nothing about it, but by saying right. that it is, say, blue over here. Right? So how would you put this in terms of the absence intuition? Uh, namely, that every absence is indeed the presence of something else. Um, yeah. So the absence intuition is true of maps because <coughs> absence of something is always a presence of yeah. something else, right? That's right. And therefore, uh, uh, insofar as there is something else present, yeah. it is not just a matter of implicature that, say, red is right. true, but in fact, it is represented by the map that, red, that this is not red insofar as it is blue and via the incompatibility uh, it cannot be red. Is that the point? Right. I wouldn't say that the content should be expressed as just this is not red. I'd say that the content is expressed it, it, by this, this is, is blue, blue. Right. and blue happens to be incompatible Correct. with red. And the incompatibility right. is what? Part of the background? Um, so incompatibility is, uh, I think the syntactic point about incompatibility, I'll mention this because I'm going to move when I talk yeah. about maps. So incompatibility is a syntactic point. It's a rule about what, what features can cohabit Good. you know, the same space, okay? Um, as map makers, we had better make sure that if two features syntactically are incompatible, then they represent incompatible features out there. If we don't do that, then we have a bad map. And actually, this is something related to what Joam brought up, actually. So um, the uh, absence intuition actually becomes not an intuition, but in fact uh, a feature um, that map makers um, uh, rely on. Yes, you can have maps that don't respect it. They're still maps. And you guys would have to say that they're incorrect. They're false maps, actually. They're essentially false maps. I'm, I don't actually have that consequence in my semantics. So I don't, get the con I don't get the consequence that they're false, and I don't get the consequence that they're not maps. So I can, you know, so it's, is the absence intuition vindicated by me? Uh, not exactly, right? I mean, you know, I can explain why it characterizes mo most maps, because you'd be crazy to make a map that works differently. It's not very helpful to do so, as we'll see. But, um, but that's where I stand uh, with respect to it. Um, so here's the idea. Take the colors in a picture, right? And now let's say 
forget about them representing chromatic features of scenes. I don't care. They, they represent something else. Maybe they represent land, sea, marsh, mountain, or whatever, right? You just come up with a group of, um, you, have this inc you have one incompatibility class, which might be colors, and then imagine just layering as many of them as you want on top of that. And each incompatibility class, right? So here's an example of a regular map. I, 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 this is at the, on the handout as well and the other in the, in the second column. Um, a lot of maps will have incompatibility classes for different kinds of land, water, marsh, and so on, right? They'll have different colors for that or maybe different, I don't, in a real map, it could be done any number of ways, cross hatching and lines or whatever, right? But they have ways of representing land and water or things like that. And all of those markers are incompatible with one another, right? So they form this beautiful little incompatibility clause. You also have perhaps different ways of representing mountainous terrain. Uh, hills, bumps, Piedmont, mountains, Alp, you know, Alpine sort of mountains and so on. You could have lots of different ways of representing mountains, hilly <coughs> terrain. And those are all mutually incompatible, right? Okay. But they're compatible with the other stuff. They're compatible with the markers for land, right? So you could have mountains on land. You can have mountains on the, on the floor of the ocean, right, for example, right? So they're compatible with any of the other features that might occupy a map. We have markers for roads on maps, okay? Markers for cities of different sizes. And typically, and now this is a, you know, there's the nitty-gritty everyday real maps and then there's a sort of formal thing. I think the practice gives evidence that the, a kind of formal structure is what we aspire to when we're making maps. Your city markers don't go together. You can't have two city markers in one place. Okay? If you have, and, and, and you know, you just don't, right? That's just not allowed. It's not physically impossible, perhaps. You could layer one on top of the other, but they just don't go together. They're incompatible. They violate the rules of the map to put more of than one of them at one place. Similarly for roads, right? Um, you can't put more than one of them at the same place. Um, typically, we could talk about that. In, in everyday map making practice, this might get violated any number of ways, right? But the thought is this, um, what makes a map, a picture like a map, and what makes maps like pictures is this. Now in a map, we have lots of these incompatibility classes, right? But they all work the same way. Remember in a picture I said, if you don't have a color there, there's a hole in the picture, right? It's not a well-formed part of the picture. You can't have a location without a color. In a map, you can't have a location without some value for each incompatibility class. That's the, it's just taking exactly the rule for pictures and layering those incompatibility classes, right? So at any point in a map, you must tell me something about the roads, something about the mountains, something about the kind of land, water, whatever, something <coughs> about the cities, okay. And so these, and, and right. Um, and each value within these incompatibility classes represents some property of the represented space. Okay. Um, then if you look and you say, look, well, each point in the represented space, okay, that must instantiate at least one value from each incompatibility class, right? This puts constraints on what the incompatibility class can look like, right? It turns out that the incompatibility classes here um, are always going to have, you see on the, when I listed these incompatibility classes, I have the null values, L0, M0, R0, C0, right? Sometimes incompatibility classes in map making practice are just, um, they don't show up as any specific kind of mark, right? So the null value for cities is just you don't have to really do much of anything on the surface of the map. The null value, for, like meaning there's no city of, there's nothing, there's no city here of any population greater than whatever, right? It's a big, ugly class of things. Um, or there's no road of any type, of any of these types here, right? A big, ugly class of things, right? A very ugly class of things. But those null values, you know, but the null values are only null in two senses. One, they're, they're assembled from all the things you want to say. We just say it's not any of those. And two, very often we don't have a special marker for those because that would be inconvenient. It's hard to make, it's actually practically speaking hard to layer many incompatibility classes. This is a miserable exercise because you have to make it possible for people to read a map and I can't come up with ways of doing that. So in lots of cases I take the stuff I care about, I put those things into an incompatibility class and then I want to say for each one of these there's a null marker. 
And so every point in the map, formally speaking, commits to one value along each of those dimensions. And any map that doesn't commit to some value along each of those dimensions is not a well-formed map, right? So you have to pick, what you're doing when you're picking a kind of map is you're picking a class of, a set of incompatibility classes. And then that's laying, and, and you pick a kind of spatial relationship between the map and whatever it's mapping. And then that will give you, um, that will give you uh, the content um, of the map, right? Um, ideally, uh, members of an incompatibility class represent incompatible features, right? And we actually saw this with Jerome's example. If, you have, if, if I cannot put, uh, Jerome's example is if I cannot put yellow and red at the same place, but yellow means city greater than 10,000 people and red means city greater than 100,000 people, then in lots of cases, I'm going to be able to, unable to represent what's true. I'm going to be able, unable to say of every part of the world that has more than uh, 10,000 people in it, that it has more than 10,000 people in it. Because I might have read there, and red just says more than 100,000. Right? And I can't say this other thing I want to say. That's a bad map. Uh, it's a map. It's just, it, it, it's, it's annoying. Um, if anyone read the paper I distributed, right, this is the, the kinglets and conifers problem in the, map, uh, in the maps paper, right? I mean, if, if you really want to represent the range of where a bunch of birds live, and you want to represent the range of trees where those birds might also live, right, you better not make the features that represent birds and trees incompatible with one another, because then you've just got to make it some places you're going to have to say, well, do I represent birds as being there or trees? But I can't do both, right? That map won't satisfy the absence intuition, but it also is just so bad as a map. It doesn't do what we want, right? So absence isn't built, absence for me is built into the semantics of these things. It's not a pragmatic phenomenon the way that uh, Ben Bronner says it is. It's not, or Liz Camp actually favors a pragmatic answer to these. Um, it's built into the uh, semantics. It's just that I'm not gonna build into the semantics that you have to make good maps. I'm just going to let you make bad ones and then suffer the consequences. Yeah. Can I ask another quick question? Yeah, yeah, of course. Because yeah. uh, I see how this works, and it's very nice. Uh, but uh, would you agree then that uh, pictures, first of all, and max, uh, maps uh, derivatively, are in some sense neutral, in fact, under specified with respect to <coughs> the what, uh, with respect to what they represent? So here's Simple example. Okay. So there are, with respect to persons, there are monists and there are dualists. The monist thinks that there is just that a person is her body. The dualist thinks that that the person and the body are distinct, yet co-located, as it were. Or for that matter, a statue and the clay that uh, that it uh, oh, that okay. it's made of. Some people, God forbid, think that there are two things: a statue <laughs> and a lump of clay. Others. Um, the good ones, think that it was just one thing. Uh, but let's, you know, the question is, the map is actually neutral, the picture is actually neutral. It depicts something, say, gray, and whether that gray picks out, so to speak, a statue or a lump of clay or a statue made of clay, or, that's not yeah, right. Uh, right. I mean, let's say you believe that they're very different things. Not that you know the statue. Someone, and someone believes that there are two things. No, I know. Yeah, yeah, the that's bird right. The and the tree cannot really penetrate. Yeah, but that's the right. The clay and the statue can, according to right, the right, right, right. So then, yeah. So that's going to actually affect our map making practice. So you wanted to give me a map Which of is? all the statues, okay. and a map that also includes all the lumps, right? right? And so. Your map, you're going to have different colors that are layered, that, you know, that can be layered right there. You might think that being a statue excludes being a lump, right? In that case, I don't think it does, but you know. Um, you might think that they're the very same thing. But I mean, I, I think there are any number of ways we could represent the world. And some of this is going to be motivated by our ontological commitments as to what's compatible and what's incompatible. Can a map distinguish these things? Oh, I think, yeah. A, a map can, dis you know, you can imagine a map distinguishing co-located things, right? I mean, it does for the conifers and the kinglets, right? The birds and the trees, right? And so let's say you really don't think birds and trees come apart, right? You, you're, you have an ontology of uh, bird trees, right? And, and that they don't, well, okay, then you might not make a map the way I would make a map. 
Does that make sense? Again? Maybe I'm not responding. I mean, yes. but you're, you said, is there essentially yes a kind no, of... Okay. If you take a picture, an ordinary picture, uh, yeah, you okay. a matinee here, right? I take okay. a photograph, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a painter, and yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, I make a portrait of John. Yeah, Ron. right. Um, now, is that a, per a portrait of one thing or a portrait of two things? Um, yeah, a person I, or a person plus a body and so on. It, it seems to me that pictures, like ordinary language, yeah. effect, are neutral in this regard, i.e., yeah. they are super true in the sense that they satisfy super valuationism. They're true no matter how you specify the underlying metaphysics. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that's Something right like for that. pictures, yeah. That sounds and, uh, right. So, and, and remember, pictures as maps, they're not going to be maps of me, right? Yeah, so they're right, maps right. of this sort of more abstract yeah. thing, right? right. So, but this raises the um, question of what properties are yeah. really being represented. It, um, it does, and, and actually you might get a different uh, story for pictures than for maps. So what I need to do with pictures, this is why I mentioned there. So I think pictures have a kind of uh, context-independent meaning that they sort of bring to contexts in which we use them. And that's going to be that very abstract pattern of chromatic features in two dimensions, right? But that pattern winds up becoming a real pictorial content when we use it a certain way. And that might be you, something, actually it won't be you, because it'll be something a lot like you. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think of pictures as attributive representation. So they're basically like descriptions. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what pictures do is give you a messy mix of qualities. Which qualities? That's gonna, that actually is going to depend on how you feel about what proper qualities are and so on. So for example, being a, you, know, you yourself are not going to be the content of a picture for me. Not, it's not a singular representation. But having an Achille look that might be okay for me because that might be a genuine property, even though a lot of people might not have a grasp of that property because they haven't seen you or met you and so on, right? Um, so that's an interesting question about pictorial content, what the qualities uh, can be. It's a little hard, and I think you actually pointed this out, it's a little hard to do metaphysics with this, right? So like, it, if you have a certain kind of metaphysics, can you make a map represent the world according to what that metaphysics says the world should be? I think yes. And that's because in the maps case, right, these incompatibility classes aren't constrained in the same way that they are in the pictures case. So the pictures case, we've got this thing where we have to say it's this perspectival chromatic and spatial features that are fixed, and then the other stuff can get determined in context. Whereas with maps, and this is the point like I have, you know, you always have to fix a legend or something like that, right? We give very precise meanings to the members of each incompatibility class. And it's sort of up to us what those meanings are. We can pick ones. The wise thing is to pick meanings within an incompatibility class that are incompatible, right? But what counts as incompatible, what actually goes into these things is, is, is open for debate. So the way that a map can be radically more expressive than a picture is that it can take as many incompatibility classes as you like, subject to practical constraints on interpretability and so on, and it can make the members of these incompatibility classes represent pretty much anything that you like. So I have, you know, I have just, I, part of this handout involves a, is that uh, more the exemplar kind of thing. One of them is a map of uh, Lebanon, uh, New Hampshire, uh, actually maps of <coughs> Lebanon, New Hampshire from 1889, 1899, and 1904. Um, and one of them is a map of Mars, but it's a geologic map of Mars, right? So it's telling you what the different kinds of land are on the surface of Mars, as it were, and it's also indicating other things. It's indicating ridiculous, it has a lot of information in it, let's put it that way. Each of those colors represents a different kind of land. Each of those sort of marks represents a different kind of geological feature. Um, each of those crater, some of the craters are marked, some are not. The craters that are marked are all above a certain size, for example, so they have that. It respects absence. Um, and, and you can see, by the way, the, the way, and colors work very strangely in these maps. So these maps are made for, for fire insurance companies. So they're actually a very good resource if you want to know what a town looked like back in the day, because they're not going to miss uh, anything. But what are the incompatibility classes? Well, yellow is a wooden structure. Okay, because you know fire insurance people care a lot about that, right? Um, whereas red is a brick structure. Right? Um, none of those colors and and you know, th there's this background color, but none of those colors in the, ho in the building thing show up in a lot of places because it's just open land, right? And that, that's just a null value of that incompatibility class that happens to represent no structure of note there. And you can tell that between 1889 and 1899 in the upper right, something happened to that little house because it's not there in 1899. You know, you can see the one on the top is there, 
but the one between the, you know, the second house down just doesn't exist in 1899. So somebody's cow kicked over a lantern and it burned down, right? That's what happened. It was a wood structure too, right? And you can tell that this has to respect absence, right, in a certain sense. But, you know, the presence of that white there indicates the absence of that structure, right? And you can, s so anyway, yes. Uh, John, you wanted to ask. It seems to me that the natural Uh, they're not pictures in, in, in they, they share a, a syntactic or semantic structure with maps, right? But what makes them very different, so you, you got it exactly right. So a picture that looks like a picture of me could be a picture of me, a picture of a wax replica of me, a picture of a picture of me is one of my favorite little examples. Um, but those options, right, those have to do with pictorial content. What the picture brings, in a con and that's fixed in a context, I think, actually, but what the picture brings to that context independently is a bunch of very abstract features, chromatically and spatially abstract, right? And so with pictures, we need a rule for getting from that abstract sort of not very specific content to something much more specific, right? So from low-level properties to kinds or stuff like that, for example? From low-level properties to more sort of specific properties, I think. You know, I think what happens is we get more specific when we, as it were, flesh out the content of a picture, right? And I think so, and I think most of the discussion about pictures, this is tendentious, so, you know, no one's going to agree with this, but anyway, it's okay, I've got picture theorists in the room to tell me I'm terrible. Um, so most of what people do when they're worrying about pictures is ask about what's the rule? How do I go from, they're not going to like this way of putting it, but how do I go from this sort of very abstract sort of weird thing to something like a real pictorial content? And some say the rule should be an experienced resemblance between that and something else. Or the rule should be a resemblance that you notice between that and something else, or an intended resemblance between that and something else, or a special kind of experience uh, that, that is elicited by that and something else, or a recognition response, and so on. All of the, so to speak, action with pictorial representation tends to get bundled into what I want to call the rule for fleshing out pictorial content. And there's nothing like that in maps, because maps have constant character. Right? So all of that is cut out of the maps issue and we just take the different features we can place and we say exactly what they mean ahead of time. Right? So there's no context of dependence or anything else like that. And so we don't have to worry about that. All we have to worry about as map makers is that the people we give the map to can tell which features are at which locations. As long as they can do that, right, then, then they can interpret the map. We have, we have legends. Uh, yeah, maps. So exactly. Are you saying that, for example, there's some kind of set of correcting conditions or rules yeah, I like yeah. Thing, it seems that they would be playing a similar role. Yeah, there could be a legend for a picture. It would just be somewhat boring. It would be one incompatibility class, and you'd be saying what happens with each member. And with respect to bare bones content, or you know, this very abstract thing, that's actually very easy to do. So if it's a line drawing, right? There are actually only two things. There's a line there or there's not. Okay. And the line might indicate one of a range of different kinds of things. In a color photograph, then there's just gonna be the range of colors, <coughs> right? Um, and they're going to indicate these, so to speak, chromatically perspectival features that require some unpacking and so, so on. Right? Lose, though, the, the, the difference between maps and pictures is that in, in maps, the legends just introduce conventionally introduced predicates. Yeah. Whereas in pictures, it's not conventional. It's somehow based on uh, yeah. some so projection uh, algorithm which allows you to convert uh, indeed. Volume to volumetric shapes, or as it matches. Uh, yeah, that's right. Shapes to kinds, this is a difference, John. Yeah. 
Amen. Yeah, this is a very important difference. And the idea is that in pictures, I have to choose my incompatibility class so that it serves the rule to get pictorial content. And if the rule to get pictorial content is something like find a recognizable manifestation of the bare bones content, then the bare bones, then what can count as the incompatibility class in a picture is going to be quite restricted uh, compared to what can count as the incompatibility class in a map. Because there is a perceptual element to the interpretation of pictures. And I have a very specific place I want to locate it. And that does, I think, explain why. There's something highly non-conventional about the maps, in compa uh, about pictures in compatibility classes, which one can work, and less so with maps. And if you want a beautiful, in my opinion, middle case between pictures and maps, you look to comics. Because what comics tend to do is they are pictorial, but they also have all of these fairly highly conventionalized things that indicate motion, that indicate other kinds of mental states, and so on, right? And, they're, and so there might be black lines, but they don't pictorially represent black lines, right? Even though other black lines do indicate black lines in the, in the scene, right? And that's because you've got another layer, right? It's an incompatibility class of motion marks that can be put onto the picture and so on and work in different ways. So I do think they're connected. And, and I actually think, well, I mean, yeah, of course I have these ambitions to put it all under one tent, right? So this is, you know, I might be, this, I this talk. Tent, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'm not saying you should like the tent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it might be a leaky tent. I don't know. I don't know how to run with this metaphor right here, but it's, it, there's something wrong with my tent, maybe. Yeah. So, um, so notice there are norms here. So if you're working with incompatibility <laughs> classes, there are norms. Like I said, violating, uh, you know, so I had these two. You want the members of an incompatibility class to represent incompatible features, and you want the members in different incompatibility classes uh, to represent compatible features. That would be really nice, right? And, and uh, uh, if you violate one, you can't, you can't represent the full distribution of all the properties you want to represent. You know, that, that was uh, Jerome's example. Whereas if you violate two, uh, it means a map might not be able, might actually be able to represent uh, impossible states of affairs. I'm not sure that I hate that. I mean, I'm, but it's not ideal, right? And you don't, you don't need it. So as long as you can ensure that the the members are compatible between incompatibility classes and incompatible within an incompatibility class. You get a very uh, beautiful way of representing things that, by the way, in a certain very real sense, mirrors the structure of what it represents, right? Okay. This is a structural mirroring that's not just spatial, okay? It's qualitative. Um, uh, for me, and this is different from Roberto and um, Achille, uh, I can give a com I think anybody can give a compositional semantics for maps. I mean, that we should we should definitely be able to do that, but I, it looks a little different. So for me, for Achille and, and um, uh, Roberto, what happens is you find atomic map stages. So you find individual colors, and you limit your map to them, right? And then you say, okay, is this one true, right? And and that's is the property represented by the color where the color is, and is it not where the color is not, okay? And instead of doing that, um, this is sort of simple, it gives different results for bad maps. But in general, what I do is I say the, the, these are not atomic, but the smallest interesting parts of a map are the incompatibility classes, right? So if you were to break a map into its parts, trying to run a compositional semantics for them, you'd ask, what does this incompatibility class, does, does the map that represents this incompatibility class get it right? Uh, or what does it say at all? I'm just doing semantics, not talking about getting it right. What does the incompatibility class, what does this other incompatibility class say? What does this third incompatibility class say? That will just generate the truth conditions for the map as a whole. So that's sort of straightforward if you want to do it that way. Um, <coughs> um, in the case of bad maps, um, this is a, might be a minor issue. I don't know how to adjudicate this. Uh, in the case of a bad map, uh, for uh, Roberto and Achille, they say the map must get it wrong. So the map cannot say, if the map can't say where everything is that it can represent as being someplace, the map has to be a false map. It's getting it wrong. I tend to think that that's not true, and it doesn't actually fall out of my semantics that that's true. So in my semantics, you get a false map. Um, but not every map has to satisfy absence, right? So if you design the map badly, you don't have to satisfy absence. Um, and false maps, uh, these are, 
you can have maps that cannot get it right <laughs> if you design a bad map. That's the idea. They don't have maps that can't get it right. You know, I mean, they could be wrong, and they could have a hard time getting it right, but their maps can always get it right. Um, some of my maps can't get it right. <laughs> and I wonder what the right way to think about, uh, what the right way to think about that um, is, actually. Um, so a lot of this that I've talked about is sort of old. I mean, by my lights, I, I, I've said it before, and I, I, I wanted to present it slightly differently from pictures to maps, because I actually think we've, a lot of you have been thinking about pictures a lot for the, for the last five months. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about some new things, because and this topic came up. So we talked about compositionality. Here's what Barbara Partee, this is on the second page of the handout. Here's what Barbara Partee says compositionality is. Uh, <coughs> the meaning of an expression is a function of the meanings of its parts and of the way in which they're syntactically combined, right? Okay. And that's quite standard. I think she, you know, she's, of course, you know, one of the big figures in this area. Um, but you'll find lots of, this is not incompatible. It's not a controversial definition of... Uh, uh, compositionality. Okay, here's, here's what I think is, I, I, I think that pictures and maps, so there's this question, John raised the issue, John Zimbeckis raised the issue, you know, are pictures and maps the same? And I said they, ha they share an interesting kind of syntactic structure. Let me be a little more specific too. I actually think the syntactic operations defined over pictures and maps are the same. In fact, there's only really one. Um, so here, here's, what is a part of a picture? When Roberto was presenting, he said, we didn't know whether to make the parts of the picture the left half and the right half or the top half and the bottom half, right? And there's a long tradition of talking about picture parts that way. So um, the earliest explicit statement of it is Eliot Sober in 1976, but I, I don't know how much earlier it goes. But the claim was that one of the things that makes pictures interesting is that if you cut them, no matter how you cut them, right? You get new pictures. You get, you get, and so the way to think about syntactic parts of pictures is you just cut them up into parts, right? Which is what you should do, because actually this fits a, an intuitive notion of what the syntactic part of a linguistic expression is, right? You have this thing, you cut the picture in half, you have this thing, I can assemble it with other parts if I want to make weird pictures and so on, the way that I assemble sentences, right? And the rule grammatically is much more boring in pictures, it's just pop them together, right? But and whereas in language we have like, you know, complex noun, verb, adverbial phrases and everything else, but there's still a rule of syntactic combination, putting things together. And that this was a thought, this motivated the imagery debate, this motivated, you know, Jerry Fodor's parts principle is actually built around this. I think that's wrong. I think it's, 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 it's just right enough not to seem wrong, but it's wrong. So, I, so, so what this notion of part gets right is that the part, a part, a syntactic part of a picture is what you get by focusing on some of the picture's syntactic qualities to the exclusion of the rest, okay? So when you cut a picture, in effect, you just say, ignore that part, that half. But what you're doing is focusing on this part of this, a, as it were, an aspect of the syntactic features of the thing, right? Only the ones on the left. But there are other ways of breaking pictures into parts, and you can actually read what you've, it's weird that you're in different, in different directions, but you know, what you guys are doing, um, you, you know, you can actually read what these folks are doing in an interesting way. When they say the parts of the map are atomic map <laughs> stages, which is actually, I think, very, like, that's, def that's totally defensible, right? I mean, my, my view is a variant on that in a sense. They're not talking about spatial parts, right? They notice that it's not very useful to cut, I mean, you can, but the useful parts for them were actually spatially completely overlapping parts, right? And in effect, what they're doing, this isn't the way that they described it or would describe it, but in effect, what they're doing is saying, and I think we've got lunch. Um, so in effect, what we're doing is, <laughs> um, in effect, what we're doing, what I'm doing is saying, one way to find a syntactic part is by cutting a picture because what you're doing is focusing on some syntactic features and ignoring the rest, okay? Another way, focus on some chromatic aspects of the picture. And it, focusing because we, we have the impression that our lunch is here. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's messing me up, you know? I mean, I... Um, but look, I actually think this... Uh, yeah, I don't know. We can stop. Uh, it fits the practice, I think, with pictures that this is what a part of a picture is, that it's some of its syntactic features to the exclusion of others. So, uh, yeah. when it comes to languages, especially regimented uh, languages, it can be a formal language yeah. that represents 
conditions uh, at the level of logical form or something like that. Um, there is no ambiguity, uh, one says, and the sense in which there's no ambiguity, i.e. regimentation got rid of ambiguity, yeah. for instance, using parentheses and so on, is that every well-formed expression admits of uh, a unique uh, decomposition right. into its uh, parts. This is why we can give a recursive theory of truth, because there is just one way of decomposing or yeah. recomposing. And that's why compositionality works, because there is a unique decomposition. You now, might think, yeah. Are you saying now that uh, yeah. pictures or maps uh, yeah. satisfy a similar unique decomposition principle into their parts? Uh, of course, on our our formal maps are made of unique decomposition because of the oh, yeah. uh, business. Yeah. Uh, does, so uh, uh, do these incompatibility classes deliver a unique decomposition um, property? I don't have, some of them, I, I, I think this isn't the interesting issue, it turns out, but, so, but for an interesting reason. So um, I think some pictures might admit of a unique, and maps might admit of a unique decomposition into smallest parts, yeah. because we can just decompose them into their uh, smallest pixels. Um, someone might, uh, don't want to talk about decomposing because it's both morbid and modish, and neither of those is a good thing to be. Um, but, you know, you can break them down into the smallest parts, and that actually turns out to be unique, you might think. Now, what I, this is very important, though. I think the, I, we're, mi we're missing the, the disanalogy between pictures and language to think that way about their parts, right? There's still motivation for compositionality, but you have to get away from modeling it on a linguistic case. In fact, I actually want to say it's trivial that pictures are compositional. It's trivial that maps are compositional. It's not trivial to give a compositional semantics for maps, because we'd have to figure out what they are. But in a, in a very... Um, Metaf in a, metaphysically speaking, it's going to be trivial because of the way that they have their parts. Okay, uh, and so the the to give articulate voice to what the syntactic aspects are that we care about that can be hard. But to know that they're compositional is actually completely uh, boring. And here's why: the process, the, the syntactic operation defined over pictures is not actually like finding uh, lexical components of uh, complex structures, right? Um, oh, interesting, okay. Um, that's not what it is, right? The process is finding, and yeah, I'll come to you in a second. The process is finding abstractions over their most determinate syntactic features, right? That's actually going to give you a part. That's what cutting is. That's what focusing on the reddish stuff to the exclusion of the greenish stuff is, right? So what you're doing is sort of doing this abstraction work, right? And that gives you the syntactic parts. And why, the reason they're syntactic parts is each aspect that I focus on has an identifiable semantic role to play in what the thing represents. Um, in that sense, it's an interesting part and an interesting syntactic part because it has its own role to play in what the thing uh, represents. But because the only syntactic operation is abstracting over detail, right? It's trivial that they're compositional because the way that this works is you fix the most determinate feature, which is going to be basically an array of colors and so on, you know, and, and other things. And then, but that's already fixed, and it's trivial that the parts are, as it were, associated with that. You can't, you can't detach the things you get by abstracting over the specifics from the specifics in that sense, right? So there's no sort of, there's no Lego building block notion of part at work here, right? It's more what you might want to call an aspect. It fits the role, the role for being parts though because it's precisely the stuff we'd want to include in a compositional semantics. Yeah. Yeah. Let me make a couple of more points because one of them is directly related to something Akilah mentioned about propositionality. And so I've already made the point about compositionality yeah. that I think maybe Akile gets it. I'm not sure anybody else gets it, but I, 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 I haven't. So you want to know what the part of a, pic a part of a picture is? Just focus on some aspect of it. Here, here's the thing. If you want to find a part of a picture, just focus on some of its aspects and exclude the rest. So just focus on the redness, not the specific shade of red. You've got a syntactic part of a picture. It has its own semantic role to play in what the picture represents. 
interestingly, this is really interesting because that's true of maps as well, okay? And what's really great if you say that is, it turns out that pictures and maps have contents that are articulate across many levels of abstraction. So the map doesn't, or the picture doesn't just represent that something scarlet, the way the lexical, the, the, the lexeme in English scarlet would. Um, it represents that it's scarlet and red and many other indeterminates of red at the same time. So it has this kind of vertically articulate content that spans levels of abstraction, okay? Now, why is that, well, why is that really interesting? Um, it gives us a new way to think about propositionality. So Liz Camp said, look, I think there's a point to talking about non-propositional representations expressing propositions. So for her, maps can express propositions, but they're non-propositional. They don't have the right structure to be propositional, okay. I don't love, I mean, I disagree with that. I mean, I think it's a good point. I, I, I just, I don't agree with the way she wants to do it. Here's an interesting, here's an interesting way in which you might think a map or a picture is non-propositional. Um, if their contents are articulate like this across levels of abstraction, most of their content, most of that articulate content has no role to play in fixing its truth conditions. So when we think about a proposition expressed, we typically think about an articulate uh, statement of truth conditions. What did this express? Well, I tell you under what conditions the thing is true, and I've got some sense of what the proposition expressed is. The interesting thing about pictures and maps and any representation like them is that once I tell you what the most specific thing is that they say about the world, I've only scratched the surface in telling you what they articulately say about the world. Extensionally speaking, I've done it. I've, I don't have anything else to do, right? Truth conditions are fixed. But if I fixed the truth conditions by saying it represents something as being scarlet, saying that it also represents the thing as red doesn't change the truth conditions, right? But it's an important thing that the picture does and gives to us, right? So one way to think about non-propositional representation is that it's representation such that most of the stuff we care about, most of the content we care about has nothing to do with the specific uh, truth conditions that are expressed by the thing. In fact, all of the action in maps and pictures happens at typically one remove from that. I do think this is partly a verbal game because I don't care whether you want to call it non-propositional. I think this is an interesting fact about pictures and maps. This is what makes them the same. So for, you know, John wants to know what makes them this, you know, diff they're very different in many ways, but what makes them the same is the way that they have parts, syntactic parts. And what makes them non-propositional is the way that those syntactic parts mean lots of aspects of their content have nothing to do with fixing truth conditions because they're already fixed uh, by much more specific, by the most specific things uh, that the picture says. So this gives you, and that's actually, so remember Rescorlo wanted the absence intuition to generate a kind of deep division between um, maps and pictures on the one hand and uh, language on the other built around predication. I don't want to do that. I actually think the way to distinguish the two isn't in terms of predication. I think maps can do the predication game very well. That's what incompatibility classes are designed to allow maps to do, in fact. The way that they're different is in how they have parts. And I think this parts story is something that people who have lots of different theories of depiction can accept, too. So you can be a recognition theorist or be a resemblance theorist or something like that, and you, can, and you could still be okay saying that the parts of pictures work this way, right? So this is also an, a different topic in a certain sense, right, than a lot of people talking about pictures are talking about. Um, not that that's bad. I, mean, I actually think that maps and pictures are related topics, and there are lots of topics to be discussed, and I'm trying to give articulate voice to something that's not exactly the topic that's discussed most of the time. So that's, that's enough for now, I guess, and we can uh, have lunch and then discuss.